and do some sort of community service activity in the community. Um, by nine, uh, from eight to 10, there's an academic component um, where they are, if you already have your high school diploma or GED, um, you, you're there getting a construction math or some other remediation. The others are going to school for those two hours a day. Everybody comes together at lunch. We provide them a full lunch program. And then in the afternoon, they're all working together doing hands-on um, either curriculum, theoretical curriculum, or hands-on building the houses, and then clean up and close down the debris from the house. So they're with us um, six to eight, eight hours a day as if this was their job. And so we learned some social logistics, um, and we put our uh, theoretical um, component, our MC3 curriculum, into the virtual space. So even though you weren't there physically, we made sure everybody had access <coughs> to computers and technology and Wi-Fi, which was a whole feat in and of itself, making sure that um, our young people were connected and that we were able to offer this curriculum virtually. Um, where we built out, we showed them how to connect their phones. We got them the free phones, the lifeline phones, to make sure that they were connected. We got everybody laptops, um, refurbished laptops, or we, the school finally um, provided laptops for everyone and just started teaching them how to adjust to this new world. So um, this is inside our warehouse. This is some of our team putting together. Uh, the frame for our tiny houses. They actually built a tiny house inside. At first it wasn't permissible to, um, through youth build, to allow this to be seen as building one unit of housing, but since COVID, they are allowed this. So we like to think that we have to encourage that change in mindset um, through this. But still, we still connect them to real opportunities in the community as well. So when they're building these, these um, tiny homes inside our facility, they do everything. They build the foundation, as you can see. They put up, they do the framing in the walls. They put in windows. They put in electrical. They run plumbing, plumbing lines, even though they don't fully connect. But they do everything that all the basic traits to build in a tiny home. This is an 18-week program. It's real work simulated. All of our instructional staff are um, journeymen um, that have worked in the trades before. Because you don't want Liz teaching you how to do construction. <laughs> Even though I'm an engineer by trade, I do the design elements, they do the hands-on construction and building. Um, talk to you about a typical day. We also provide barrier removal services like breakfast and lunch. Every day, full breakfast, full lunch is available to them. But also all the other things, transportation, connection to housing, connection to child care. We provide them all their PPE gear, boots, coveralls, hard hats, goggles, gloves, tools, and tools for whatever industry that they want to go into, all as part of these resources um, to ensure their success. And then once they complete their training and they get certification in OSHA, HAZMAT, HAZWOPER, confined space, first aid CPR, all those industry certifications, then they get an additional paid 500 hours of on-the-job training, either through Habitat or through one of our other projects like Dignity Moves or even repurposing some of the affordable housing units that success in this um, home. And then once they complete that, that qualifies them for higher pay and um, union apprenticeship. And the iron workers, laborers, um, uh, carpenters, and plumbers are some of the list trades that we have direct agreement with um, and that support our training. Um, additionally, they go out to sites, they visit sites, they go to their other training facilities because while they're here, they get to practice a little bit of everything because how many of us really knew what we wanted to be when we grow up? <laughs> I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, but they get an opportunity to see, they might come in wanting to be a carpenter and then learn about electrician and then they switch their ideas about the trades. And that's what we want. We want them to have a safe space and place where they can learn and figure out if this is this something they really want to do and start narrowing down on their, on their scope. Um, alternative education is really the key and the crux of these. Um, and we want to try to make sure that all, because nobody is going to be able to um, thrive in this economy if you don't have at least a high school diploma. 
And even then, we gotta continue to encourage our young people to be lifelong learners. And so we had established our Early Morning Study Academy <coughs> over 22 years ago, which was really focused on GED, where we were graduating 80% um, of all the Courtney County School Day students. Um, so the San Francisco Unified School District really started jumping on and wanted to support us because these are students that they failed or have failed their system. And, um, but then when we got the youth build, um, we also wanted to provide um, our students with high school diplomas. And we knew John Muir was a partner who understood youth build, who understood the Conservation Corps, who understood the young people that we were trying to serve. And so we've been partnered with them since the inception of this grant. Um, we also do individualized assessments, we help them credit recovery, um, we give them credit for experiential learning. So in addition to um, the, the three R's, the academic stuff, they also get credit for participating in the vocational training and getting those certifications um, as well. And that goes toward the completion of their high school um, diploma. And then once a week, we all sit down and we do case conferences. So we really get to know what the needs are from a personal, professional, and academic um, perspective and ensure that everybody's on the same page with the students. So it's gonna be very hard for them to slip out of our grasp because we're all um, that because we're all in tune to what the needs of each of the students are. Um, and then we got a graduation coming up on July 13th. My favorite time of the year. Celebrate the young people. So this is Six units of affordable housing that we just completed um, June 22 um, with our first um, youth build cohort. So they had an opportunity. This was a hole in the ground. I think this was even a whole gas station. Um, my husband joined us. This, we live not too far from here, and it was crazy seeing this big um, hole in the ground. And now to see that this is housing that you know six families now are living in that wasn't there before, it's pretty amazing. And just imagine how esteemed and elated this makes these young people knowing when they hand the keys over to these families, I have to build that. It's pretty cool. Um, and so um, this, these uh, young people from throughout our program provided these five, you know, rotated in and out, providing over 500 hours of hands-on training here in collaboration with Habitat for Humanity. Um, during this time, uh, um, we also uh, had to pivot right in the middle of our, our grant. When we came in, we were in real strong partnership with our WIV and the Building and Trades Council. And then the Building and Trades Council fell out of love with the city and county of San Francisco and put a halt on all training. And we really relied on them for our MC3 training. So in the middle of our first contract, we had to pivot. So it's very important that you're nimble with this contract as well, too, because I wasn't losing $2 million grant with the feds. I had to figure out how to pivot. So there's two curriculum that they'll allow. One is the MC3, which in our um, locality is, it was developed and built by the unions and the trades, which is the one that we wanted to go with to enhance our partnership and make sure our relationship was strong with them. And the other is NCCR, which is from non-housing, I mean non-union um, homeowners, home builders association. Our local does not support that at all. It's political and it's touchy-feely, but we had to switch that curriculum so we wouldn't impact our um, DOL grant and can keep our program going and keep the services going. Um, but now that the, um, the city and the building and trades programs are back together, now we had to pivot again and go back to the MC3. Um, but that was political for us locally, so you gotta be in tune to your relationships and you gotta be in tune to those subtle nuances that could make or break your relationships. I can't emphasize that any stronger about how those relationships we talked about are key and critical to this grant and are mandated by DOL to sustain your youth bill grant and locally, you just need to make sure those things um, remain intact. And then um, this is our mayor, Woo! Uh, Mayor London Bree, um, a young person that um, my husband and I got an opportunity to mentor as she was coming up to was participatory in some of our programs, um, very supportive of us. And that, again, is key um, as well. 
But um, this organization, Dignity Moves, um, had gone to the mayor to offer um, interim housing. And we've been wanting to try to sell or market our tiny homes since the inception of our construction training program. And because of all the requirements that California requires for a homeowner, home builders, they wouldn't allow us to build our, to utilize our tiny homes for the for Until um, during COVID, Dignity Moves was able to convince the city and county of San Francisco to put up these modular homes in lieu of tent cities. Well, heck, if you're going to come in town and build tiny houses, you're not going to do it without success because we've been trying to do that for years. And so we met with the folks at Dignity Moves in collaboration with the mayor, and our young people got a chance to help to build this interim housing. Um, it's that um, it's built on a community college uh, parking lot where they had set up for tent, as a tent city during COVID, um, and we were able to replace them with um, tiny homes. And again, we utilize um, our young people here. Um, oh, oh, too far. Um, this is the, those were the parking lots where you see, um, here was a parking lot. This is a community college building. These were the parking lots, and we replaced that with 10 cities before that have been replaced by 70 units of interim housing. Um, it's to help folks get out of survival mode. Um, they're really nice. We partnered with IKEA to help furnish them. Um, here's um, a gentleman that's in one of the units. This is the size of them. We have one bed, it's an air and heat and cooling unit. There's a desk in there. Um, and they're really nice. They have a key. So if you have your own, there sleeps one individual cottage like this that you know our young people help to do. Um, and this is so important. I had um, this this gentleman, Mr. Sherman, um, was a homeless man that um, befriended me years ago. Um, he used to be panhandling in front of the, the Starbucks in front of um, my job a few years ago. And I had just lost my dad, so he reminded me so much of him. And every morning he would open up the door, good morning, sunshine. And um, I would say good morning. He never asked me for no money or anything. Um, but I would see him every morning. He would greet me. And um, this one particular morning, it was really foggy. And he was, his chest was wheezing really bad. And I felt so bad for him that I called the hot team, which is the street outreach team, and asked them if they could provide him, you know, take him to a shelter and provide him a shelter. And um, I went on to work. And when I got there the next morning, he said, Sunshine, don't call those people on me no more. I was like, but you, your chest. And he was like, yeah, but I rather, you know, panhandle and acquire enough money to have my own individual unit as opposed to going into a shelter where I'm an old man, they take my things, I have to struggle, they sleep me on the floor, uh -huh. I just rather have it. So it really warmed my heart to know that gentlemen like Mr. Sherman have an opportunity to have a unit like this as opposed to going into a dormitory style shelter program that um, you know just really wasn't conducive for his needs. That we have options like this and people would wrap around services to support him. So, it just really, I just want to share that little story with you guys because it just, there's many people out there like Mr. Sherman who are just down on their luck, but really need to continue to support the independence. And it feels good to have been able to build units like this for him, even just for an interim basis. So now we're not only looking at San Francisco building more, but also in the surrounding towns. Um, and then we own our own affordable housing. Success Center uh, did uh, four mergers in 2018, where we acquired, yes, yeah, shoot me, um, where we acquired um, 37 units of affordable housing. And this is family owned housing, and um, this housing is um, almost paid for now, yay. Um, and it, we can go in there, as a matter of fact, we just had a crew go in and they go in there rehab when we have vacancies, they go in and they fix up and prepare the units for a new vacancies. So these are individuals, again, that have completed the program and are going inside um, to help us with, fix these up. Um, and um, some of the, 
the lessons that we learned um, from this experience. We're on our second Youth Build grant right now with that. Make good use of your startup time. Reaffirm those relationships with all those key players and partners. Be sure you're in good um, with those guys and you have solid MOUs and contracts. Um, this is a federal grant and as we all know, is can be a bear to manage. And so the things that we want to stay definitely on top of is your fiscal system. I'm really blessed that my CFO worked with me at the private industry council before, had been an auditor before, um, it was a controller at the CFO when there were picks, and we just stay tethered to each other over the years, um, as well as your data management system. There's so many dots and bells and whistles, particularly as being a nonprofit, small nonprofit provider, my budget's about $10 million. Um, compared to a web or compared to a state system, it's a, it's a lot. So we've had to realign our data management system to make sure that we're checking the boxes and, and crossing the, dotting the I's and crossing the T's. So you gotta make sure that you have strong management, fiscal and programmatic and data management system. Um, get those MOUs and contracts with all your partners. Be sure that we agree to agree um, and that they understand the tenets of this work. Um, because sugar, honey, iced tea happens. So you need a plan A, B, and C, as I talked about um, before, in case political things happen, like you know the city falling out of love with the building and trade council and vice versa, and I had to pivot um, not to lose um, my grant. The other good thing that DOL provides um, with this program and project is we get a coach. And our coach has run youth field programs in the past and other federally fund funded programs and youth programs. So we have a really good coach who helps us with everything but the fiscal management stuff. So programmatically, they really help to make sure that um, um, we are understanding our points. So use your coach if you get a coach. And then DOL um, has a bunch of online tools and lots of training. Take advantage of that. There's these tons and tons of things. Um, and ensure, remember we heard about those match dollars, 25% match, um, that you have as many match dollars um, for your programs and services um, to offset some of those things that youth bill will not, or your DOL grant will not pay for, i.e. food. But since COVID, in youth programs, you can do pay for food as part of your supportive service. Little tip, tidbit trick. Um, so what's next? So this gentleman here, David, is one of our first ones to be journeyed. Woo woo! Now we had another young lady who just also got her journey in construction, so we're really excited. So we want to expand more to our, we're in uh, two detention facilities in San Francisco or San Mateo County, so we want to, and we're going to expand our services there. We just got some local dollars to do that. So that when young people get out of detention, they can come into the program. Um, we're expanding to other counties um, where we're supporting the reentry population, as I just mentioned. Um, we wanna, we haven't used our own properties, but we wanna build out and use our own properties um, to help build out the space there. And um, we wanna also think about how to develop other revenue streams, like selling our tiny homes. Um, creating maintenance schools for affordable housing where um, we also just um, won an accelerated grant um, where we can take our crews while they're waiting to go to work. Um, we can support them through um, our accelerated grant where we're getting contracts to do maintenance, to do um, it with the, the local housing authorities and within affordable housing spaces to do the maintenance, to rehab the units and things like that as an interim job while they're waiting to go into um, the construction, um, into the unit. And this is the old picture and it's halfway built, but this is another habitat site that we're building at uh, 90 Amber, Amber Drive in, in San Francisco. Um, and that's going to be nine units. A uh, beautiful housing that oversees the whole city. Oh my God, the view is incredible. So that's who we are, that's what we've done. Um, here's our team um, that helps to support a collection of things. And I'm gonna be quiet so I can learn and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for your time.